What's up everybody, welcome to another video and I hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video I'm going to talk about the Cantor set, which is something that often comes up in either a real analysis or measure theory course. And I think it's a pretty interesting set. It has a lot of cool properties. Some of them may even be a little bit counterintuitive, which is always fun. So hopefully you get something out of this video. Hopefully you enjoy it. Let's jump right into it. So this is how we can construct the Cantor set. What we do is we start with this closed interval from zero to one. And then what we do is we remove the open middle third of this interval. So that means we're removing the open interval from one third to two thirds. And when we remove that, what we're left with are these two disjoint closed intervals from zero to one third and two thirds to one, right? So our C1 is defined as the union of these two closed disjoint intervals. Then we repeat this process. We look at this sub interval of C1 from zero to one third, and we again remove the open middle third, which in this case is from one ninth to two ninths. And when we remove that, we're left with two closed disjoint intervals. We do a similar thing with two thirds to one. We end up removing the open interval from seven ninths to eight ninths. So our C2 is the union of four closed disjoint intervals. We keep repeating this process. We can do the same thing to get from C2 to C3, which will be eight closed disjoint intervals. And we can keep going and how the Cantor set is defined is as the infinite intersection of all these sets that we construct in this way, right? So let's kind of get some intuition around what actually is an element of the Cantor set. And what I'd like to point out is that once we have an end point in any of these intervals, for example, let's look at the first set here from zero to one. Zero and one are both end points of an interval, and it turns out that zero is in every set after, right? So zero is gonna be in all of these sets and it's never gonna leave because we're gonna keep removing open middle thirds and zero is always gonna be an end point. So it's always gonna be in all these sets. So it's definitely gonna be in the intersection, this infinite intersection. So is one using the same logic and still using the same logic, we can determine that anytime we have any end point in any of these intervals, we can conclude that it is an element of the Cantor set. So zero, one, one third, two thirds, seven ninths, two twenty sevens, all of these numbers are elements of the Cantor set, right? So we end up with all of the endpoints. And another really cool thing is that we actually have no intervals once we complete this infinite intersection process. There are no intervals. In other words, there do not exist real numbers A and B such that this closed interval is a subset of C. Those don't exist. There's no intervals contained in the Cantor set. So that's something that's pretty cool to look at. Now let's talk about the measure of this set. If you don't have any idea of what measure is or you've never studied measure, hopefully I'll explain it in a way that makes it a little bit intuitive and easy to understand. But essentially the measure of a set is a way of assigning a notion of size to the set, right? So for example, the measure of this set C0, since this is an interval, the measure is its length. So the measure of this set is one. And how we often write this is using the symbol mu of C0 equals one. So the measure of this set is one, okay? Here we have the union of two disjoint intervals. So we can simply take the length of this interval and add it to the length of this interval, and that's gonna be the measure of this C1. So the measure of C1 is equal to, this length is one third, one third, so two thirds, right? Similarly, we have four closed disjoint intervals, each with a length of one ninth. So the sum of the lengths of each of these intervals gives us that this has a measure of four ninths. So I'll cut out the measure symbol just because I ran out of room here. And we can continue this process if we can find the measure of any of these CNs for any N in the set of non-negative integers, right? And what we can do is come up with actually a formula that can give us the measure of CN for any N. And it turns out that the measure of CN for any N is two over three to the N. We can quickly verify that this is true just based on our well, not verify, but convince ourselves, right? Because the measure of C0 is two thirds to the zero, that's one, that's true. C1, two thirds to the one, that's two thirds, that's true. C2, two thirds squared, that's four over nine, that's true. And this does hold for any of these 
set. So we know how to find the measure of any of these CNs we want to look at. But remember, the Cantor set is this infinite intersection. We want to find the measure of this Cantor set. And this is where we need to rely on a property of measure called continuity from above. And this may not be the only way to find the measure of the Cantor set, but this is the way I like to do it. So I'll have this continuity from above pop up on the screen in case you've never seen it before, but essentially we need to first verify two things. We need to look at our collection or sequence of sets, and we need to verify that CN plus one is a subset of CN for each N. And another way people often say this is that our sequence of sets is decreasing, right? That's one way to think about it. But do we have that? Is that the case? Well, C1 is a subset of C0 for sure. C2 is a subset of C1. So yes, we do have that, right? CN plus one is a subset of CN for any N. So that checks out. Next thing we need to verify is that we have at least one of these sets that has finite measure. So a measure less than infinity, which we do have. We've already confirmed that three of them have finite measure. So clearly that's the case. So we verified those two requirements. And now we can conclude that the measure of this infinite intersection the measure of this infinite intersection is equal to the limit of the measures of Cn as n goes to infinity, right? And what is the measure of Cn? That's 2 over 3 to the n. So that's equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 over 3 to the n, which is equal to 0. So this Cantor set has a measure of 0. Hopefully y'all can see that on the screen there. So pretty cool. We have a set of measure 0, and it turns out that this set is also uncountable, right? Which is, at least for me when I first learned about this, was a little bit counterintuitive because one of the first things you learn in a measure 3 course is that any countable set has a measure of 0. So then, for me at least, it was a little bit intuitive for me to think that maybe the converse of that was true, right? So any countable set has a measure of zero, and I wanted to jump to the conclusion that, well, that means that any set of measure zero must be countable, which is not true, and this is a clear counter example. So hopefully that made sense. Now we're going to define this Cantor set a little more precisely in a different way using the base three system, and then we're going to actually prove that this set, or at least outline the proof, that this set is in fact uncountable. So here's another way we can think about the Cantor set, and it turns out this is gonna become very useful when we prove that the Cantor set is uncountable. First, we can let x be an element of this closed interval from zero to one. Then it turns out that x is an element of the Cantor set if and only if x does not require the digit one in order to be expressed as a ternary or base three fraction, okay? So I'm gonna give a very quick review of what base three means. So if you already know what that means, feel free to skip ahead. But first I'd like to talk about base 10, which is the standard base system we use when we're doing everyday math and a lot of us don't even really think about it, right? So using base 10, we have 10 digits to choose from, zero through nine. And we can write numbers like this, which we typically do like 24.71. And how we interpret this is this is two times 10 because it's in the tens place. This is four times one because it's in the ones place, right? That's where that kind of comes from is this base 10 system. So we can write this as two times 10 to the first. I'll write the first there because we're gonna notice a pattern plus four times what? One, but I'll write that as 10 to the zero because here we have plus seven times a lot of us would think of it as seven times 0.1. You could think of it as seven over 10. That's how I prefer to think of it in that fraction form. But I'll write it as 10 to the negative one plus one times 10 to the negative two. So this is the pattern. When we're in this place directly to the left of the decimal, that's always when we have whatever base raised to the zeroth power. As we move to the left, we increase the power by one each time. As we move to the right, we decrease by one. And we could also write this in fraction form. So this is two times 10 to the first, four times 10 to the zero, plus we can write this as seven over 10 to the first, plus one over 10 to the second. And this is the way that I prefer to write it personally, but either way, it's the same idea. So 
when we change to our base three system, when we're writing numbers in their base three representation, we only need three digits, zero, one, and two, right? Just like binary uses two digits, zero and one. So we have three digits to choose from, and instead of these tens being here, we have threes, okay? So let's write out an example using this base three system, and then we'll quickly look at some elements of the Cantor set and write them in this form using uh, without using the digit one, okay? So first, let's look at, here, I'll do two, one, point, zero, one, something like this. So writing this in our base three system, this is now two times three to the first. Two times three to the first plus one times three to the zero plus, and I'm gonna go straight to the fraction form. So zero over three to the first plus one over three squared. So one over nine, right? So hopefully it's making sense how we can write these numbers in the base three using the base three representation. Now let's look at some elements of the Cantor set. So let's see if we can write out some numbers between zero and one and write them without using the digit one and then relate them to what we know about the Cantor set. So maybe we can write out something like, well, this is a super easy example, point zero. That definitely uh, doesn't use one. And this is in fact equal to zero, which we know is an element of the Cantor set. What about something like point two? Well, that's equal to what? Two over three to the first. So that's two thirds. That's definitely an element of the Cantor set. And we can keep doing this. We can keep messing around with this. 0 0.02 will give us zero over three to the first plus two over three squared, which is two over nine. And two over nine we know is an element of the Cantor set. But I'd like to point one thing out. What about 0.1? What is this equal? Based on our definition or theorem here, we should expect this to not be an element of the Cantor set, but it turns out that this is one over three, which is an element of the Cantor set. So what's going on here? Is our theorem wrong? Did we do something weird? Where it turns out that our theorem isn't wrong. We're using this very specific wording that says, if and only if X does not require the digit one in order to be expressed in this way, right? So maybe expressing one third in this base three representation doesn't require the digit one, and it turns out that it doesn't, because we can write this as point zero two two repeating, going on forever. It turns out that point zero two two repeating is equal to point one in ternary, and therefore we can write this without using one, so it does line up, it doesn't contradict this, right? So be careful of this, this is a very similar idea of the fact that point nine nine repeating equals one in our base 10 system, which is something that some people argue about, it turns out it is true. If you need to go do the research and convince yourself of that, that's fine. But we do need to understand this in order to fully be convinced that this holds. And that's the basic idea. Anything that we can express in ternary form without using the digit one, using only zeros and twos, those are all elements of the Cantor set. And at most, any element of the Cantor set will have two different ternary representations, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Now let's go ahead and see if we can prove that the Cantor set is uncountable. All right, so here's the proof that the Cantor set is uncountable. We're gonna use proof by contradiction. So we're gonna assume for the sake of contradiction that the Cantor set is countable. Then that means that we can list it out like this. We can enumerate all the elements of the Cantor set. Then what we can do is write each element in ternary without using the digit one. So only using zeros and twos. So we can list each element out like this. We can write it out as a ternary decimal using only zeros and twos. And then how we get our contradiction is actually the exact same argument that's used to show the real numbers are uncountable. And it's this diagonal idea. We look at the diagonals and we pick a new number. And how we construct this new number is based on these diagonals. So I have it written out formally here if you want to read it, but I will explain it. We're going to construct this new number that is a ternary decimal. And now we're going to construct it is we're going to look at C11. If this is a zero, then we're going to put a two here. If this is a two, then we're going to put a zero. Then we're going to look at C22 and do the same thing. If this is a zero, we're going to put a two. If it's a two, we're going to put a zero. So what we have is a new number that 
is different from every number in the list because we've changed one of these numbers. It's different than every other, so it's not on our list, but it also contains only zeros and twos. So it's an element of the Cantor set that we've constructed here, but it isn't in our list. And that's where we get our contradiction because if this were countable, then we should be able to list out every element of the Cantor set but I found here an element that's not in our list, and that's the contradiction. So hopefully that makes sense. It's very similar to the proof that the real numbers are uncountable. In this case, we're just using ternary instead of our base 10 system. But hopefully that makes sense. I think the Cantor set is interesting. There's more stuff about it. I think I mentioned that it doesn't contain any intervals. It also doesn't contain any isolated points, and it's also completely disconnected, and there may be a couple of other properties that I'm forgetting. So maybe I'll make a part two and I'll look into some of that other stuff. But hopefully you got something out of this video. Leave me feedback below if I didn't explain something well or if you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments. I'll respond to all the comments. Thanks for the support. Keep flexing those brain muscles and I'll see y'all later.